In this lecture, we will look at both simple and complex distribution of charge and the associated electric fields that go with those charges. We'll use the basic principles of the point electric charge field, and we will build up to larger and larger structures, starting with very simple additions of electric field vectors and concluding with a general discussion of how one employs calculus to handle more complex distributions. Since, like force, electric field is a vector, we must add electric fields that are present in the same region of space but caused by separate sources together as vectors. So if we ever want to know the total electric field at some location in space, let's say a point P, which I'll denote here on this graph paper, if there are two electric fields present, for instance, one that points this way and is denoted E1 vector, and another one that points this way with a different length and is denoted E2 vector, then the total electric field here is simply the sum of E1 vector and E2 vector. And that means that you have to add the x components and the y components and the z components of each of the electric fields separately, and then that resulting sum, component by component, gives you the total vector. To put this in a sort of generic algebraic notation, let's imagine that we have the vectors pictured here. So E1 could be written as E1x in the i-hat direction plus E1y in the j-hat direction. And E2 could be written similarly as E2x in the i-hat direction along the x direction and E2y along j hat, the positive y direction. Now, E1, y, E1, x, E2, x, and so forth, these could be positive numbers or negative numbers, so they could flip the directions of the unit vectors along the coordinate axes. But for right now, I'm just going to leave them as algebraic symbols that represent numbers, which could be either positive or negative. And if we have to add these together, then of course we wind up with a relatively complicated looking thing here in E total. So now if I try to write E total symbolically, it's going to be the sum of the x components, which are E1x and E2x, and that sum will be in the resulting x direction, or i hat, unit vector direction. And then I will move down to this line just to keep this nice and clear, but then we have E1y plus E2y and that sum then also points in the uh, j hat direction. Now, E1x and E2x may be numbers with different signs, so they might add up or they might cancel out. Uh, you might get a resulting positive number or a negative number from doing the addition of the components. It's the sign of that number that will tell you whether or not you have to flip from the positive i hat direction to the negative i hat direction to get the final x component. So quite generically, this is how one sums up electric fields. And even more generally, if you have an arbitrary number of electric fields, so imagine a point P that is subject to a whole bunch of different electric fields. There's our point P right there. Each of these might be a different electric field with different magnitude and different direction. You can see this is getting quite complicated now. Well. It's a finite number, it's only five individual electric fields that one has to consider at this point. Uh, and generically in algebra, when one sees this, one denotes now the total as the, uh, the sum from i equals one to five of e sub i vector. So i is an index, it's a placeholder in this so-called summation notation. The big Greek sigma symbol means sum over, and the index tells you its minimum and its maximum on the top. So we want to make the index go from uh, electric field number one all the way up to electric field number five, and we want to sum each of them together. So this written out represents E1 plus E2 plus E3 plus E4 plus E5. You can see why this summation notation is so convenient. If one had to write this out uh, as an actual sum by hand every time, 
it would get quite clunky to have to do this. And in fact, what if I had 100 electric fields here that I had to add? I'm not going to write E1 plus E2 plus E3 all the way up to E100. I'm going to write this more compact form, and I'm going to take the index and say it starts at 1, and I'm going to tell the index that it ends at 100. And then I can have that nice compact symbol that I write down on my piece of paper. Saves a lot of ink, saves a lot of space. Having motivated generally how one adds together electric fields from different sources, we can now consider a simple combination of charges and start to think about what the electric field at any point in space around that set of charges is going to look like. In the original lecture on electric field, I considered really just single point charges. And in the simulation that I showed you, I considered what happens to the electric fields of two point charges when they're put in proximity to one another. And I let the computer calculate all of that. But I'd like to go back and actually take a pair of charges, one with a positive sign, one with a negative sign, and consider at any point in space, what's the electric field going to look like? And this is going to look quite complicated, but we're going to consider a simplifying case of this. And actually, by doing this exercise, we're going to motivate a very important piece of chemistry and biology, which is present in the natural world all the time, and that is something called the electric dipole. So let's consider a negative charge and a positive charge that are separated by some distance. So I will denote this as a line between the two, and we will call that distance d. You know, d could be measured in meters, centimeters, millimeters, nanometers, something like that, but it's essentially in meters. The charges are equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign. So the positive has charge plus q, and the negative has charge minus q. This is a special case. Of course, I could have picked any two charges to be here, uh, but I'm going to motivate the electric field sum from this particular configuration and then use it to talk about something called the electric dipole. Uh, you could instead replace the positive charge with uh, a negative charge, for instance, that has twice the magnitude of the first negative charge that I drew. That's a very different situation. That's not an electric dipole. I'm going to consider this very special case. Now, the final thing that an electric dipole specifically has is rigidity. It is impossible for the charges to move toward each other or away from each other. It's as if they were fixed on the ends of a rod and held in place. Now, that's not a necessity for what I'm about to do. That's a necessity later when I talk very specifically about the electric dipole. Uh, but I'm just going to mention that feature now, and I'll come back to it again later. Now, we already have a sense of what the electric fields from these two objects are going to look like. I mean, a guy you can hand sketch. The electric field from the positive charge, for instance, I can draw a few lines of force for this. And actually, let me draw a total of eight lines of force just to get a nice clean picture here. So I would expect my electric field to start on the positive charge. Positive charges are the sources of electric field by convention and I would expect them to radiate outward. Now, I'm only considering the electric field from the positive charge. I don't care what the electric field from the negative charge is doing to change this uh, shape that I've just drawn. We'll come to that. Now, let's consider the negative charge. Well, again, ignoring the positive charge and thinking only about what the electric field of a single negative charge is going to look like. We already know that from the pictorial representation, from the sketching that we did in the original electric field uh, lecture that all of the lines of force should point in and again to be symmetric between the two to be fair and equal between the both of them I'm going to draw eight lines of force. Now from this picture we can already see graphically vectorally what we expect to happen at different points in space so let's pick a few different points in space and think about what the electric field lines are going to do there. So for instance, I might pick this point right here in between the two charges. Uh, we'll call this P1, and we'll come back to that in a moment. I might pick this point down here, P2, and I might pick this point up here, P3, just for convenience sake. Let's consider what's going on at P1. Here, if I sketch this out, I have the 
electric field for the negative charge pointing to the left, and I also conveniently have the electric field for the positive charge pointing to the left. And let me put a little minus sign above this and a little plus sign above this to remind you which field line goes with which charge. And we see they, they point along the exact same direction. They're already neatly lined up uh, head to tail. And so we already know what vectors head to tail are going to do. They're going to very simply add. All you have to do is add their lengths and the direction that the resulting vector points in is the same. So if these vectors were both pointing along negative i hat, and let me go ahead and sketch this, uh, we're going to call this E1 negative, and we're going to call this E1 positive. I could uh, d just declare that the horizontal direction is the x direction, and so I can immediately write these in unit vector notation. This one is equal to E1 uh, negative, and I'm going to put a magnitude around that so that we know that that's exactly a positive number, times negative i hat. And we know immediately what, uh, what uh, E1 positive is going to look like. It's going to look like E1 positive, and I'm going to, again, I'm going to put these absolute value lines around it to indicate that this is a positive number. I'm going to put all the sign here in the unit vector, and this also points in the negative i hat direction. So to add them together is quite simple and let me go ahead and do that. So I would expect that the electric field total at point 1, which is the sum of the electric field from the negative charge at point 1 and the electric field from the positive charge at point 1. This is a very easy sum. It's just the sum of these two positive numbers. The magnitude E1 minus plus the magnitude E1 plus, and that's all going to be in the negative i hat direction. So that's not so bad. We could now, for instance, plug in for the magnitudes of point charges, uh, electric fields. Okay, so just to, to sketch this out, we would expect that the magnitude of the point charge electric field E1 is going to be equal to k q remember for the uh, negative charge uh, the magnitude of the charge is just q and because this is a magnitude there are no signs left over so to be quite explicit about this I could put the magnitude signs around everything I'm about to do and put the minus sign in front of the q there we're going to have the the distance from the negative charge squared and because this is a magnitude, that unit vector that would normally sit out in front of the full electric field vector equation, we take the magnitude of that, and the magnitude of a unit vector is 1. So we don't have to write it. That 1 is implied here. We're multiplying this whole thing by 1. Now, I've been explicit about putting the magnitude uh, absolute value lines around this, so I'm just going to go one more step and say that this is equal to kq over r minus squared. So this is just the constant k. 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newton meter squared per coulomb squared times the charge magnitude of the negative charge, which is just Q, divided by the distance that we are from the uh, negative charge squared. So if I was going to go back here and draw this, uh, if this is the negative charge over here, then we have this is R minus. It's the distance starting from the negative charge going to the point P where we're measuring the electric field. It's that distance vector and of course we're taking the magnitude of it and squaring that. So it's just R minus squared. And you can repeat this now. You could take E1 plus and write that down. Okay. So why don't I go ahead and do that. <clears throat> Continuing over here, our exercise from point P1, we have that the magnitude of E1 minus is equal to KQ over r minus squared. And similarly, if you work through it, the magnitude of point one of the positive electric field is going to be given by k q over r plus squared. And if we now want to get the total electric field at point one, all we have to do is sum these coefficients. So we have k q over r minus squared plus k q 
over r plus squared, the distance from the positive charge squared, all times negative i hat. And we can pull out the common factor kq, and we're just left with 1 over r minus squared plus 1 over r plus squared, and in this case, the direction is the negative i hat direction. That's about as far as we can take it without knowing some numbers. For instance, how far exactly are we from the negative charge? Uh, how far exactly are we from the positive charge? What is the magnitude of the charge of either of these two? Q. What is Q? We don't know that. And again, keep in mind that this is a very special case. We're right on the line that connects the two charges, and I've declared that to be the x-axis, so I've really simplified my, my vector here. I've, I've said it lies on the x-axis, and so all distances along this axis will point either in positive i-hat or negative i-hat. Let's consider point P2. So point P2 is a little bit harder. If I draw the electric fields at point P2, the negative charge's electric field points up and to the left, if you were to extend the original drawing I did, and the positive electric charge's electric field points down and to the left. And where those arrows uh, meet head to tail, that's point P2. So now we have a situation where the vectors do not lie along the same line. Now you have to write all their components out with the i hat and the j hat. You can't just drop one of them anymore because we're clearly not working on a single coordinate axis here. And in fact, if I were to sketch coordinate axes like this, where this is x and this is y, you see immediately that you're going to have to do some trigonometry get the components of the positive electric field vector and the negative electric field vector and then add those components together to get the resulting total vector. This one's a bit more complicated. Uh, and so in fact what one has to do here is something that's quite a bit more complicated but I'm going to basically write the answer down for you and what I'd welcome you doing is making sure that what I'm about to do makes sense. Can you get to the same answer that I'm going to get to? Just as a symbolic algebraic equation. So I will argue that if you work through the vector uh, algebra here using the fact that the electric field I'm gonna go ahead and write this out in its full glory uh, the electric field from the positive charge is going to look uh, like this so here's the positive electric field Now I can't drop the r hat anymore because I'm talking about full vectors. And then I'm going to add to it the negative electric field at this point, P2. Well, now I have to leave the minus sign in. We're not talking about magnitudes anymore. We're talking about the full symbols with all of their signs. So the negative electric charge has a negative electric charge. And then we just have the distance to the negative electric charge from the point P2 and we have the unit vector r minus hat. Well there are some common symbols here. So we can pull the k and the q out but we really can't get this much simpler and so we're left with something that doesn't look terribly pretty. But in many ways this is the most generic thing you could write down. Actually let me go ahead and put the minus sign from the charge in between the two of them here like this. Okay, so this right here is the total electric field at this point P2 in a very generic notation. In fact, I could use this very same equation for the total electric field from this positive and negative charge system really at any point in space as long as at that point in space I figure out what's R plus, what's R minus, what's R plus hat in vector notation, and what's R minus hat in vector notation. So I can pick a pretty arbitrary point in space, write down my coordinate axes, decompose my vectors, use trigonometry to figure out the components, and then write all that down explicit to that point in space. If somebody were to tell me exactly where in space I was uh, doing the calculation, I could put some real numbers in here. 
Okay, But I would argue that you could always start from this nasty looking formula here, do the trig, use your coordinate system, use the numbers that you're given, and then write down the total electric field really anywhere around this particular pair of charges. So let's take what we have just established as a basic framework for doing calculations of electric fields for this system, the dipole, and let's apply it to a special case. So the special case that I would like us to consider is essentially sketched in the picture in the upper right here. And that special case is consider a point P that lies along the line that connects the two charges. And I'm going to write that line as the x-axis. So what we would like to find is what is the dipole field specifically along this connecting line, this connecting axis between the two charges basically the line denoted with length D for this system. So to figure this out, what we're going to do is we're going to take this very general formula up here and we're going to try to homogenize it and simplify it to this very specific case. And to give you a, uh, a few useful bits here, of course we're going to be summing vectors, so the first thing we have to do is we have to establish a coordinate system. And I've drawn a conventional coordinate system that's used for this problem where the y-axis and the x-axis meet at an origin that is exactly halfway in between the two charges, such that the distance along the x-axis to either charge is negative d over 2 to get to the negative charge, and positive d over 2 to get to the positive charge. So all I've done is taken the distance between the two, cut it in half, and said that that halfway point is where zero is on the x-axis, and then of course I've drawn my y-axis straight through that, that zero at 90 degrees to the x-axis. That's my coordinate system. Now, the, the point P is a distance x from the origin and that's along the x-axis itself. So the point P lies on the x-axis, it has no y-coordinate, y is equal to zero for P. Uh, and the distance, however, though, we don't know what it is, it's just some variable x, so it's some distance x. It could be positive number, so it could be to the right of the positive charge. Uh, it could still be a positive number but lie to the left of the positive charge but ahead of the origin. You know, it could be a negative number that lies to the right of the negative charge uh, or it could be a negative number that lies way to the left of the negative charge. Uh, we don't know and that's okay. We're just going to use X as a placeholder to set this question up of exactly what this electric field will look like. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to use this information, this coordinate system and this new variable X that denotes the distance that P is from the origin, we need to use this information to try to solve for some of the things that we don't know. Well, what do we know? Well, we know K, and we know Q, or at least we're going to assume that we were given a charge at some point, but Q is just some number, so we don't have to figure that out. That would be given or not, it's a symbol or it's not. But in terms of the information we have been given, we do have to figure out things like R vector. So for instance, R plus vector, and R minus vector. We don't know what those are, and we have to figure those out in terms of our coordinate system. And these would then allow us access to things like R plus, R minus, R plus hat, and R minus hat, the corresponding unit vectors that just indicate the direction that R, R plus vector and R minus vector point. So really getting any pairs of this information will help us already. If we can get R plus and R plus hat, for instance, we can get the full R plus vector. Or if we can get R plus and R plus vector, we can get R plus hat. Uh, they're all connected to each other. And similarly, we hope to do the same thing for the negative charge. Let's focus on the positive charge right now. So let's just focus on quantities that we could derive for the positive charge from the picture that I've drawn in the upper right here. Well, for instance, it's actually not as hard as you'd think to figure out what the distance R plus is. So R plus that's the distance from uh, the positive charge plus Q to the point P. So this right here is R plus vector. It goes from the source of the electric field 
to the place where the electric field is being measured by convention. Again, something to memorize. That's the full vector. We can get its magnitude using information we've been given. We know that the point P is a distance x from the origin. So we know that using green, we know that this distance here is x. And we know that the distance that the positive charge is from the origin is d over 2. And so we can very quickly use this information to figure out what exactly r plus is. We can see that x, which goes from the origin all the way out to point p, minus d over 2 is going to be equal to just the pure distance from the positive charge to the point p. So again, this is the distance x, but we're interested in the distance from the positive charge to the point p. So to get that, we have to subtract off this little piece of distance between the origin and the positive charge. So x minus d over 2 equals r plus. We're done. We figured out a piece of information using other stuff that we were given in the problem. So that's great. Let's keep going. We now need the unit vector. Well, this one isn't so bad, right? I mean, let's look at this. All we need to know is what is the length one vector that indicates the direction from the positive charge here to the point P here where we're measuring the electric field. Well, all the action takes place on the x-axis, and we see that the point P is going to, uh, just, you know, quite naively, it's going to be uh, somewhere to the right of the positive charge. So that's in the positive x direction. So we can already know, without really doing any work at all, that the unit vector r plus hat is simply i hat. It indicates a direction positively along the x-axis because we are to the right of the positive charge and that is a direction that is positively along the x-axis. And that's it. We just need to know the direction. We don't have to know anything else. But what's great about this is we can assemble these pieces of information and we can get the full r plus vector. Although we don't really need it. We need r hat. We need the magnitude of the distance. Let's just go ahead and write it down. So we have that the r plus vector is x minus d over 2 i hat. Done. We've got all three pieces of information. So you see how getting any two of these will result in giving you the third pretty much for free. And that's because they're all related to one another. Awesome. Well, we can repeat this success for the negative charge. And I'm just going to write down the answers. R minus is equal to x plus d over 2. And if that confuses you, rewind a little bit, look at that picture, get some pen and paper, see if you can figure it out. R minus hat is also equal to i hat. And again, if that's confusing, rewind the video, look at the picture, get some pen and paper, see if you can figure it out. We don't need it, but I'm just going to be complete, and I'm going to write down r minus vector. That's just x plus d over 2, i hat. And now we can go back and have a look at this formula generically for the dipole electric field anywhere in space around the dipole. Now we're specifically interested in turning this into the electric field along this axis to the right of the charges for the dipole. So all we have to do to adapt this generic formula into this more specific thing we're looking for is plug in the specific things that we have learned. So let's go ahead and do that. E dipole along the axis, this is a very special electric field, is K, Q. Now, we have uh, 1 over R plus squared times the unit vector R plus hat. So we have 1 all over X minus D over 2 all squared times I hat. And then we have minus 1 over r minus squared, which is x plus d over 2, all squared, 
again, i hat. Well, we see some common things here. The unit vectors are the same on both of these terms in this uh, difference inside the square brackets. So that's another common factor that can be pulled out in front. So let's go ahead and do that. Remember, these unit vectors are just algebraic symbols. They're independent from the other things that are being drawn in here. But if you see two of them in a sum, you can pull them out as a common multiplicative factor in front of the sum. There's nothing that says you can't do that. It's just that you can't mix i hats and j hats and k hats. Uh, they're distinct from one another. And so if one of them multiplies one term and a different one multiplies the other term, you don't get to pull both of them out. That's bad. But we can do this here because it's the same unit vector, i hat. And now we're just left with this beast. which we can simplify. Now I invite you to add in the missing steps for what I'm about to do, but I'll give you a hint. All you have to do is find for the stuff inside the square brackets a common denominator for these two terms and this will yield new numerators and you will add those numerators together and then try to simplify the result. And what you will find is the following equation. kq i hat 2dx all over x minus d over 2 squared and x plus d over 2 squared. And I'm going to leave it at that. This is the electric field including magnitude and direction of the dipole as one moves along the x-axis that connects the two charges. This is a special case. This is not a generic electric field. This is not necessarily what the electric field looks like anywhere off the x-axis. But along that axis, along that line that connects the two charges, this is what the electric field looks like in all of its glory. Now you'd have to be given the distance x, you'd have to be told the separation of the two charges d, you need to, the charge magnitude on either of them q in order to do a numerical calculation with this, but nonetheless all the ingredients are here to do something like that. You could be given numbers and plug them in and get an answer and it would be glorious. Let's go one step further. Now the math trick we're going to use is when one has a small number added to a big number, you can effectively ignore the small number as long as the difference in sizes between the two of them is great enough. So for instance, if I have 1 plus 0 0.01, I can write that as 1.01. .01. If I have 1000 plus 0 0.01, I could go ahead and write that as 1000.01. .01. But 1,000 is already a very big number compared to 0.01, and so it's okay to say that this is approximately just equal to 1,000. That is, adding a tiny number to a big number doesn't really significantly change the value of the big number, especially if this is like 1 times 10 to the 9 plus 0 0.01. It's pretty safe to say that that's approximately just 1 times 10 to the 9. So a billion is approximately a billion even if you add a hundredth to it. So we're going to take advantage of that and look at a special, special case. And that is what happens if we move our observation point P. So here's the positive and negative charges. Here's the distance D between them. So what happens if we move our observation point P very, 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 very far away from the dipole system itself. So this is our distance x, and this indicates a big gap in distance occurs along this axis. In other words, this axis is not a linear representation of distance. For all we know, uh, a whole three orders of magnitude of distance could be hidden in this little gap here along the line. So I'm using this intentionally to mean that there's a jump in distance that I'm not showing here and this point P could be very far away. 
And in fact, the way we denote this mathematically is we say, consider the special case where the distance x is much, much greater than the distance d. Then, any time you have a term like this, x plus d, you can say, well, that's just approximately x. And if I have x minus d, then eh, that's also approximately x. I'm just taking a very small number, d, and I'm either adding, in, adding or subtracting it from a very great number, x, and that doesn't really change x all that much. And if I do anything to the number d to make it even smaller, like for instance, x plus d over 2, that's also really going to be approximately x, or x minus d over 2. Anytime I see a term like that, I'm not really changing the value of x in any meaningful or significant way. And so I can go ahead and write it just as x. So let's go back to our electric field. The electric field... So let's go back to our electric field. This is the electric field of the dipole along this axis, and it was written exactly as k q i hat times 2 d x all over this seemingly nasty little product of stuff that I didn't even bother to write out. Extend that a little bit there. That's the exact formula. Now consider the case and I'll put this in parentheses here, where x is much, much greater than d. Well, in that case, we see we have terms in the denominator, x minus d over 2, x plus d over 2. And what did I say about small numbers? Well, if you've got a small number added to a big number, or a small number subtracted from a big number, you basically don't change the big number. So we can approximately write this as k q i hat 2dx all over x squared x squared. Again, x minus d over 2 is approximately x. x plus d over 2 is approximately x. So these sums collapse into just x all squared and x all squared. This is nice because you see I have x to the fourth in the denominator and an x in the numerator. And this simplifies one more step to 2d over x cubed. This is a special, special case. If you have a tiny dipole whose separation is infinitesimal compared to your observation distance, you get to use this approximation as long as you're looking at the electric field along the axis that separates the two charges. And there are real cases of this in the real world. And in fact, I'll talk about one of those in just a bit. But this is a greatly simple, simplified formula. This is much easier to work with than the nasty general thing that we wrote down up here, which is already a special case of the dipole electric field. So all you have to know here is the separation between the uh, two charges and the distance that you're observing from. And as long as that distance is far greater than the separation, you can use this formula, no problem. But if your observation distance is comparable to the size of the separation between the two charges, you do not get to use this formula. So keep that in mind. Special, special case. Now one last bit of nomenclature I'd like to introduce here for the dipole, which is what we've been exploring in this video, which is really, in many ways, the next most simple charge distribution in nature. It's a very common charge distribution in nature, as you'll see. Electric dipoles are distinguished, as I said earlier, by the fact that you have equal magnitude but opposite sign charges separated by a distance d. Now you'll notice from the way that I wrote my coordinate axes before when I set up this problem that in the formula I just wrote up here where we are observing at some distant point p away from the uh, dipole itself that we have uh, the direction i hat so where does i hat point? i hat points this way. It points to the positive uh, x direction. And we have this quantity q times d, which appears in the equation. So we have q 
and D. This quantity appears in dipole problems all the time. And in fact, it's given a very special name. It's the dipole moment. And in fact, to be quite specific, it is the electric dipole moment, or at least it's its magnitude. So Q times D is a special quantity. It's defined only for dipoles. So when you have equal magnitude, opposite sign charges, rigidly separated by a distance D. And you can use it to quantify very quickly the properties of the dipole itself. And I'll show you why. In this case, from the formula above, for this special, special case, where x is much, much greater than d, we can write, uh, now using the dipole moment, uh, a simplified version of the formula that I just had here. So we have 2p over x cubed k i hat. So I've just substituted for q times d with p, the electric dipole moment magnitude. It's possible to define the electric dipole moment vector. It's one more step. P vector is equal to the magnitude of P times a unit vector that points in the direction that the dipole moment is pointing. This is not a surprise. Any vector can be defined this way as the magnitude of that vector times the direction unit vector in which it points. Well, we've already identified what the magnitude is. It's q times d. So all we have to do is figure out what is p hat. Well, we were given p hat. p hat in this problem, this special special case, is equal to i hat. Now, let's look schematically at what i hat is. It's a unit vector, denoted here. And let's think about what direction it points from and what direction it points to. Yes, it points in the positive x direction, but in a dipole system, it quite specifically points from the negative charge to the positive charge. I can transport this vector over here without changing its direction, and it's still the same vector. And it points from the negative to the positive. So quite generically, p vector is a vector with magnitude equal to q times d, the magnitude of the charge of either of the dipole charges, and the d, the distance separating them, both positive numbers, that points from the negative charge to the positive charge, from negative q to positive q. That is the most general definition of the dipole moment, the electric dipole moment, and that is the full vector. That is the whole electric dipole moment. And what's great about the electric dipole moment is once you specify Q and D and that direction from the negative charge to the positive charge, you can tilt the dipole any way you want and all you have to do is continue to specify Q and D and the direction that points from the negative to the positive charge and you know the full orientation and separation and magnitude of the charges of the two. And in fact dipole moments are a whole lot easier to measure than individual charges and distances in a dipole, especially when those dipoles are very tiny. Here in all of its glory is a schematic of the dipole electric field. This is far better than I could ever draw it. This is a rendering straight from the textbook and it gives you an idea using just a handful of electric field lines of how complex the dipole electric field can actually be. The base of the dipole electric field, the electric field strength along the axis connecting the two charges. And then we've looked at an extra special case where we take the approximation that we go very far away from the dipole and look at its electric field. We haven't looked at any random points around this. So you get now from this picture a sense of, of just how rich and varied the structure of this electric field can be. It turns out that this is one of the most important electric fields in nature. Where do you find dipoles in nature? Well, pretty much everywhere. As a very macroscopic example, here is a schematic of a thunder cloud. Uh, you're very used to the idea in North Texas of storm systems moving in and you get lightning strikes. Well, lightning strikes are caused when you have... Uh, 
Lightning strikes are caused when you have water droplets in the clouds rising up, brushing past ice crystals in the clouds. The friction between the droplets and the crystals uh, basically transfers charge, right? So you get the triboelectric effect, a charge induced due to friction. Charges are transferred from droplets to the uh, ice crystals, which drop low in the clouds, and you get a charge separation up in the cloud system. This induces, uh, through strong electric field lines from the bottom of the cloud, a corresponding opposite sign charge in the ground. So, for instance, you might get a buildup of negative electric charge in the ground due to the electric fields from positive electric now, when those electric fields build up to a specific minimum strength, which I covered in an earlier lecture, the air molecules themselves can no longer retain their integrity, the e electrons, and because they're being ripped apart by these external electric fields from the cloud and ground. And what happens is that the, for instance, nitrogen molecules rip apart. This causes uh, a big separation of charge, which essentially turns air into a perfect conductor, and you get this massive transfer of charge from either the ground to the cloud or from the cloud to the ground. You, know, you get different kinds of lightning depending on how the transfer occurs. So until that breakdown point, you have a dipole. You have a big positive charge up in the base of the clouds, and you have a corresponding equal but opposite sign negative charge down in the ground. And as long as the electric field strength between those two doesn't exceed a certain minimum value, everything's going to be fine. But when they do, you get an electric field breakdown of the air. Charge is transferred. The system becomes briefly electrically neutral until the tribal electric effect generates more uh, electric charge in the clouds and the whole thing repeats itself again with a subsequent lightning strike and then another lightning strike and so forth. Now one of the most important places that dipoles occur are in molecules themselves. This is a cartoon of a water molecule. It consists of two hydrogen atoms bonded to a single oxygen atom. Now because of the nature of the bond the hydrogens lie on one side and the oxygen which is much larger it has a, many more electrons uh, sort of occupies the other side of the molecule and so you get this Mickey Mouse head shaped molecule with a separation of charge the hydrogen atoms bond to the oxygen atom by sharing electrons with the oxygen atom and so the electrons that normally would be orbiting the hydrogen atoms uniformly are spending somewhat more of their time over in the oxygen atom and this causes the naked protons inside of the hydrogen atom to sit on one side of the molecule and then the electrons uh, add a net negative electric charge to the other side of the molecule and you get a charge separation. You get this naturally occurring electric dipole molecule. You have more positive charge on one side, more negative charge on the other. And so as a result of that, water dipoles, as we'll explore in a future lecture, tend to line up such that the negative charges on, of one uh, uh, water molecule um, align closely with the positive charges of a neighboring water molecule. And this whole process repeats. And this causes a force between water molecules. It's not an extremely strong force, but it's the water molecule and its dipole bonding to other water molecules is one of the first challenges that we as human beings have to overcome when we're born. Many infants are unlucky enough to have been born significantly premature. This is a fairly common thing that, that happens. And as human beings, uh, we've developed medical practices that allow us to deal with early births. Births that are early enough that the final stages of human development, particularly lung development, have not finalized. If a six to eight week old premature infant is born, one of the things that they're lacking in their lungs is a chemical called a surfactant that re relieves surface tension in the lungs. Now, where does that surface tension play an essential role? Well, the lungs are basically filled with tiny sacs called alveoli, and when those sacs expand, we take in air and thus get oxygen. The oxygen is exchanged, and CO2, the waste product of uh, processing oxygen, is expelled. And when you compress the alveoli, you exhale a breath, and the uh, waste product CO2 leaves your, your body. That's the way it's supposed to work. But on the inside surface of every alveolar sac is a thin layer of water. And it's uh, so thin that it's strongly affected by surface tension. Surface tension is just the molecule to molecule bonding between the water dipoles in the volume of water right on its surface. 
Now that bond is normally not very strong, but for an infant with underdeveloped lungs, lacking this uh, chemical called the surfactant that can relieve surface tension, this is essentially a death sentence. Because while the infant may be able to draw their first breath when they uh, leave the womb, once they exhale the, the, their first uh, waste product CO2, the alveoli will collapse and the surface tension of the water is so great that the sacs cannot reinflate unless that surface tension can be, re can be reduced in some way. So without that surfactant, which is naturally produced in the very last stages of infant development, that first breath is also the last one. So normally what happens when you're born significantly premature is that the attending physician or nurse uh, in the room will take an inhaler and they'll put it in the baby's mouth and they'll inject a small amount of surfactant into their lungs. That surfactant is recycled, so it will stay in there for many days or weeks until the body is able to naturally produce its own surfactant. Uh, this is also why premature infants need respirators. Uh, it's just too difficult. Their lungs have not fully developed, uh, and so they can't really breathe on their own. So within just a few weeks, they're typically off respirators, and then they can go home. They just have to be home monitored. But it's that first encounter with the dipole, specifically the water molecule dipole, that can, that can be the last encounter that one has with a molecule outside the womb if one doesn't know that uh, surface tension, which is caused by the dipole force between two adjacent dipoles, can be a strong and very difficult to overcome thing for underdeveloped lungs. So I hope you get a sense of how the dipole it plays an essential role in the world around us and why it's important to understand where it comes from and how to define its parts and how to describe it in space and how to, how to picture its electric field. We're going to use the dipole concept a lot in this course, but you see how it connects to the world around you. How does one handle far more complicated distributions of charge? For instance, I could imagine having some mashed potato shaped amorphous blob of material. Uh, imagine this thing is actually three-dimensional. I've, I've sketched it only in two dimensions, but I'm not going to put the effort into making this look nice in 3D. But imagine this is some 3D blob of material that can hold a net electric charge on its surface. How then does one calculate the electric field due to something like this? Well, the short answer is you use a computer. But in order to use a computer to do this, you have to understand the basic principles that underlie the calculations that the computer is going to do. And that basic principle at its heart is really just the electric field of a point charge. This blob could be represented as a sum over Avogadro's number of atoms. So that's going to be 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And we'll write this as Ai, where each atom contains a nucleus and electrons that orbit the nucleus. Uh, Avogadro's number is a typical number of things you find in a terrestrial-sized object. A pen, a refrigerator, magnet, a cup of coffee. That all roughly has about Avogadro's number worth of stuff inside of it. And at the heart of all that stuff are point charges. As we know from looking at the, the atomic theory of nature, uh, we have a situation where we have a central nucleus with a positive charge being orbited by a large number of electrons, each carrying a negative charge. And for all intents and purposes, and as far as experimental science has been able to determine, the electron truly is a point charge. Protons are not, but for our purposes, they will effectively behave like point charges. So we can imagine that this blob is made from a huge number of points, all added up to give the illusion of a solid blob of material. It's an excellent approximation, and it's consistent with the atomic theory of matter. So we're going to use that, and we're going to employ calculus in order to calculate the total electric field. So let's imagine that we're over here at some point, P. And we would like to know, what is the total electric field at this point, P, equal to? I'm going to sketch schematically how this is going to work. We're not actually going to calculate the electric field of this randomly shaped blob. Again, I would need a computer to do that. But what I can do is I can give you the basic ideas, and then we can work problems together that demonstrate how you apply these ideas. So let's begin. This total electric field is going to be equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n, where n could be Avogadro's number, of electric fields 
from individual point charges. So all I have to do is sum up K QI over RI squared R hat I for each of those Avogadro's numbers worth of things. So what is R? Well, if I pick a random blob and label it I, so here, here's a, here's a nice blob, a piece, okay, this is a little piece of the blob. All right, uh, I can begin to write down all my little conventions. I know that this thing's going to have some little charge and I'm going to denote that little piece of charge that is part of the whole charge of the entire object in calculus notation as dq sub i for now. I'm going to drop the i's in a minute when I actually do the, uh, the calculus in this. This is a differential. It's not two symbols, d and qi. It's a single symbol representing a tiny little piece of charge. A finite sized piece of charge might be written as delta qi. So if this is some finite sized thing, not big, but a piece that's big enough that you could sum up the pieces by hand, you might write this as just delta qi. But if the pieces are so tiny and so numerous that you could never imagine writing the sum by hand, uh, then we write this as a differential. And this is an infinites infinitesimal size charge. So for instance it could be an elementary charge. There's no way you could add up by hand all the elementary charges in an object. That would take more than your lifetime to do that. Okay well that's the little piece of charge of that little piece of the blob and now of course we have to write down vectors. So the convention is that the vector ri goes from the source of the force, or the source of the electric field in this case, to the thing that's feeling the force, or to the point that's uh, where we're trying to measure the electric field. So there's our R sub I for that little piece of charge dQi. And of course this is going to have a corresponding magnitude Ri and a corresponding unit vector Ri. And that's about as far as we can take this just with one piece. Now this could be any point. Um, we would have to then figure out the radii for each and every single piece of this blob over here and then add up all of those pieces. That's why it's important to use a computer to do this because you could actually break this into a million points and let a computer add this up for you by hand without having to use calculus. Calculus is a shortcut that we're going to use with simple shapes where the relationship between where the dq is and the uh, dimensions and geometry of the object are very easily relatable to one another. So lines, uh, spheres, circles, those are all very well-defined geometries, they're very regular, and you can handle those fairly easily using uh, the techniques of calculus. But for something that's quite amorphous like what I've drawn here, it doesn't make sense to attempt to do this with calculus because there's no well-defined relationship between the geometry, the shape of this thing, and how far you are from different parts of it. Okay, so all we can really do schematically at this point is turn this into a calculus problem. So let's go ahead and do that. So now I'm going to convert this into a calculus problem. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to remind you that in calculus, you do this sum in the limit that the infinitesimal things have a size that goes to zero. Okay, so you can go back and you can look up the raw definition of an integral. Remember the integral is the uh, antiderivative, so it undoes what the derivative does. And the derivative also involves taking small pieces, adding them onto the coordinates of a function, solving as much as you can, and then sending those pieces to size zero to solve the problem. So the total electric field in our case will be an integral from some minimum value to be determined to some maximum value to be determined of our constant k, our differential dq, and since we're doing the sum implicitly now I don't have to put that little subscript i on it anymore, the distance from that dq to the point where we're measuring the electric field, and that's squared, 
and then finally the unit vector that points along the direction of that vector. Now, how the heck do we go to the next step with this? Well, it's very hard to do that with the blob. Again, I would just, in a computer, now that I know that all I have to do is sum up a bunch of point charges, I would break it into a bunch of uniformly sized point charges, maybe a million of them, and then let the computer add up the electric fields for me with all the vectors and all that stuff. No problem. Uh, we're going to do problems in class, however, where we actually look at simple shapes like a line of charge and uh, see how you can assess that using the rules of calculus and get the total electric field without having to manually break it up into a million points and then add them up by hand or program a computer to do that. So we'll illuminate the next step in person rather than doing this in the video and then you'll get some hands-on experience with doing integrals to get electric fields as well.